Growing up attending American public schools, I assumed that the adults had good reason for running the schools the way they did. I assumed it was the best way for the kids to learn the best. As I got older and attended college to become a teacher, I realized that schools might not be run in the kids' best interest, which many of you probably already realize. I have done plenty of research on why schools are the way they are today based on how they're run, but what I have never really done is looked at the history of where the public education system comes from. And so I've done that, and what I found out truly shocked me to my core. But it explained why our public education system seems like it's not really designed to educate. Today we'll be briefly touching on the roots of the education system, but we're mainly going to discuss the progressive era in the United States and how it changed education forever. I'm going to be explaining what the robber barons, the OG capitalist, the cutthroat, union-busting, court-packing titans of industry, John D's Nuts Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie had to do with designing a system of education that created worker drones ready to create their mass produced products. I'm going to provide some commentary for context, but mostly what I'm going to be doing is looking at quotes from people at the time to see how they perceived this shift by people in the industry of education. At the end, I'm going to share some secondary sources by some people in education in the 50s, 60s and 70s who had who understood what education was like beforehand and what shifts had been made that changed it to how it is today. The first public schools by European settlers in what is now the United States propped up in New England in the Hartford and Massachusetts Bay colonies in the 1630s. At this point, and for several hundred years after, almost everyone, including black children, would get an education and be literate. This was for the express purpose of reading the Bible. Schooling past middle school was reserved for those that would become teachers and the clergy, often from the aristocracy. In the 19th century, Massachusetts and Connecticut again led the nation in education, enacting the standardized common schools based on the model of Prussia, a model that was steeped in the nationalism of that era. This model spread throughout the United States, but only students slated for the clergy, lawyers, doctors, and others attended high school. The next major shift occurs in the Gilded Age. In 1890, only 10% of 14 to 17 year olds went to high school, but by 1940, it was over 70% of that same age group. On the face, this was a good thing, more education and more literacy, but like foreign aid to a resource rich nation in Africa with no powerful national political structure, the increase in schooling comes with some major caveats. Carnegie founded his Carnegie Foundation in 1905 and Rockefeller founded his General Education Board in 1902. The stated object of the General education board was the promotion of education within the United States of America without distinction of race, sex, or creed. Both these organizations served to educate the population, but like so many other oligarchs of both then and of today, the millions or billions in today's loans donated to these tax-exempt organizations really served another purpose. But you don't have to take my word for it. Listen to John D. Rockefeller himself, who said, I do not want a nation of thinkers, I want a nation of workers. And if you don't believe him, let's see what his advisor, who ran the organization, the General Education Board, had to say. He said, In our dreams, we have limitless resources, and the people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hand. The present educational conventions fade from our minds, and unhampered by tradition, we work our own goodwill upon a grateful and responsive rural folk. We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers or men of learning or of science. We are not to raise up among them authors, orators, poets, or men of letters. We shall not search for embryo great artists, painters, musicians, nor will we cherish even the humbler ambition to raise up from among them lawyers, doctors, preachers, statesmen, of whom we now have ample supply. That's Reverend Frederick T. Gates, business advisor to John D. Rockefeller Sr. in 1913. They were successful at their mission. The schools bent to their will, the funding from the huge businessmen was taken, and the schools were remade in the image that the business giants wanted, ensuring an expansion of their massive fortunes as workers were trained to work for them, prepared from a young age for the docility required of them at their future factory job. The problems with the new style of education was seen very early. Elward P. Cubberly, Stanford's Dean of Education, had this to say in 1916. Our schools are, in a sense, factories in which the raw products, children, are to be shaped and fashioned into the products to meet the various demands of life. It is the business of the school to build its pupils according to the specifications laid down. Every manufacturing establishment that turns out a standard product or series of products of any kind maintains a force of efficiency experts to study the methods of procedure and to measure and test the output of its works. Building pupil demands. 
Continuous measurement of production to see if it is according to specifications and elimination of waste in manufacture. Another contemporary education administrator, William Torrey Harris, U.S. Commissioner of Education from 1889 to 1906, had this to say. Our schools have been scientifically designed to prevent overeducation from happening. The average American should be content with their humble role in life because they're not tempted to think about any other role. All of these men are saying the same thing, though some feel it as positive and some negative. They are saying that public education, as it was created, as it still stands in a similar way today, was intended and had the effect of preparing American workers to gladly accept their given socioeconomic caste and, for most, factory job. The issues then were not lost on the National Education Association, a teacher's union that still exists today, it's the largest union in the country. In 1914, the problems they saw were made clear and the situation was described as quite dire. We view with alarm the activity of the Carnegie and Rockefeller foundations, agencies not in any way responsible to the people, in their efforts to control the policies of our state educational institutions, to fashion after their conception, and to standardize our courses of study, and to surround the institutions with conditions which menace true academic freedom and defeat the primary purpose of democracy as heretofore preserved inviolate in our common schools, normal schools, and universities. The alarm would soon fade, not because the problem had been fixed, but because the organization was reorganized in 1917 in such a way for those in favor of the changes to control even the NEA. In the same year, the Smith-Hughes Act passed, which provided federal funding for vocational training, traditionally the responsibility of trade unions. The act was supported by manufacturing giants like Rockefeller and Carnegie and successfully took this power from the trade unions, funded by taxpayers rather than the manufacturers themselves. At this point, there was little resistance to the changes in education. Funding was provided by these giant organizations only to those schools and universities that would further their goals. And as a result, education as an industry was taken over by those who supported the philosophy of workers, not thinkers. The organizations continued to function and promote their ideas of schooling, including standardized tests and regimented schooling separated by bells. By the 1950s, the effects of the schools were being noticed enough to warrant a congressional inquiry on the actions of some tax-exempt organizations like the Carnegie and Rockefeller Foundations. The 1953 Dodd Report found Carnegie and Rockefeller Foundations had used their funds for grants with the following agendas in mind. Directing education in the United States towards an international viewpoint and discrediting the traditions to which it formerly had been dedicated. Decreasing the dependency of education upon the resources of the local community and freeing it from any of the natural safeguards inherent in this American tradition. Changing both school and college curricula to the point where they sometimes denied the principles underlying the American way of life. Financing experiments designed to determine the most effective means by which education could be pressed into service of a political nature. Despite these findings, little was done based on the lobbying power of these organizations. In a 1970 bestseller, Future Shock, Alvin Toffler succinctly described how the education system he knew related to the factory work he performed as an adult. Mass education was the ingenious machine constructed by industrialism to produce the kind of adults it needed. The problem was inordinately complex. How to pre-adapt children for a new world, a world of repetitive indoor toil, smoke, noise, machines, crowded living conditions, collective discipline, a world in which time was to be relegated not by the cycle of sun and moon, but by the factory whistle and the clock. The solution was an educational system that, in its very structure, simulated this new world. The system did not emerge instantly. Even today, it retains throwback elements from pre-industrial society. Yet the whole idea of assembling masses of students, raw materials, to be processed by teachers, workers, in a centrally located school, factory, was a stroke of industrial genius. The whole administrative hierarchy of education, as it grew up, followed the model of industrial bureaucracy. The very organization of knowledge into permanent disciplines was grounded on industrial assumptions. Children marched from place to place and sat in assigned stations. Bells rang to announce changes of time. The inner life of the school thus became an anticipatory mirror, a perfect introduction to industrial society. The most criticized features of education today, the regimentation, lack of individualization, the rigid systems of seating, grouping, grading, and marking, the authoritarian role of the teacher, are precisely those that made mass public education so effective an instrument of adaption for its place and time.